All right, so <clears throat> today's section is 6.3. It's called Volumes of Revolution, but it is called Cylindrical Shells. And so in particular, cylindrical shells is a different method than disc or washer method, okay? So it's another way of approaching things, kind of like to solve a quadratic, you could factor or you could use the quadratic formula and they sort of have different flavors, but they, at the end of the day, they sort of achieve the same goal. Um, and so even though we've been moving through chapter six pretty quickly, just because we're you know in summer school, I do wanna just review a little bit about what we've covered. And I think this will help uh, center us for tomorrow's exam as well, okay? So we're gonna start with area between two curves, all right? And that, my friends, was from se section 6.1 in your text, right? So area between two curves. And we took this idea that um, we could take the integral of a function and that would always give us the area between a curve and the x-axis. However, if we wanted to extend things, we could say that maybe there's a top curve and maybe there's a bottom curve and therefore we can sort of solve more types of problems and if we think about what those graphs might look like we might have a situation where we have you know one curve and then we have another curve and we would be trying to find this area in between Right, And we would usually start, we would call this A, we would call this B. And as we're finding the um, individual heights of the rectangles, if we add them all together, we'll end up with the area between the two curves. And one clue that we might wanna remember about this one is that our equations, oh my gosh, equations should, have x's in them. Okay, so equations should have x's in them. Now, in contrast, we also know that we can look at sort of a sideways situation. Okay, and maybe we have a right curve and a left curve in that case. So when we graph our function, we notice that the pictures sort of sideways looking. And what I mean by that is we might have a function like this, right? And then we might have another function that's like something like this. And a picture like this maybe makes us think, well, we don't wanna draw the lines this way, but rather we wanna kind of draw lines this way, okay? And we tend to call this bottom bound C, this upper bound D, just to let ourselves know that these are not X values, that they're Y values. And similar to what we can say for the first one, we actually want equations should have Y's. And so that dy, c, d, and the equation, all of those letters should match together. And then in the first one, our a and our b, our dx, and our x's in the equation, all of those should match as well. And so a chart like this, I think, is a pretty good summary of like an entire section, right? And so I've been asking you all summer, like if you want the extra credit, there's room to make a reference sheet. And some of the styles like this, having like a compare and contrast chart might be a really useful thing for you to think about as you're um, synthesizing that information, okay? All right, so we talked about area between two curves, and then we talked about volume by disc or washer method. And that was from the second part of section 6.2. And so if we take a look at this first uh, block, we have two different equations, right? Volume equals pi, the integral from a to b of r squared dx, or the second one where we have pi, the integral from a to b of big r squared minus little r squared dx. And so when we think about these two equations, 
we might want to think about the fact that the first one is just a filled donut, right? There's no hole to subtract. And those purple lines will always touch the axis of revolution. Okay, so purple lines touch axis of revolution. All right. Now the second one, this volume with the big R squared minus little r squared, we want to think about a different visual, right? Instead of a filled in circle, we've got a washer situation, or we've referred to that as like a regular donut. And one way we might know from our pictures is that the purple lines do not always touch the axis of revolution. Okay, so considering that diagram is so important to deciding, am I going to need to subtract something or not? The last thing I want to write in this box, these purple lines, they are perpendicular to the axis of revolution. Okay. So that perpendicular idea is actually going to be really important for us today, because if we draw some purple lines and they end up parallel to our axis of revolution, we're actually going to be using this cylindrical shells method. Okay. All right. If we were to think about what we can take from here for the dy situation. I think that everything we've written actually stays the same, right? It's if there's no big R squared minus little r squared, it's going to be a filled donut. Whereas if we are subtracting something, it's going to be a regular donut. But I do want to add one more piece to both of these. And I think that will be like, this is like the what's different between the two, OK? If I have dx and I have x bounds, all right, what this means is my axis of revolution is horizontal. Okay. If your axis of revolution is horizontal and you're drawing these vertical purple lines, what you're actually telling yourself is that you're going to be using disk or washer method. Okay. Now I write horizontal here because in our case, so for us, all of these axis of revolutions are going to be the x axis. There are different levels of problems where <clears throat> that axis of revolution is like y equals three or y equals negative seven. We're not going to get into that. But I did want to leave that door open for you to think about that sometimes we'll have a horizontal axis of revolution that might not just be the x axis. And if we were to modify the dy side, our axis of revolution is vertical. And for us, that means the y axis. Okay. So again, with so much content and things moving so quickly, um, we want to think about ways to organize our thoughts in a way that makes sense for us beyond just copying down formulas. But how do we really take the formulas and highlight those important pieces so that when we're approaching a problem, when we look at what we wrote down, it's actually really helpful, OK? All right. so. Let's begin our story today about a what if, all right? So by now, you know I love this situation where this is all fine and good. Let's see if we can use what we know. And sometimes we can't, right? And that sometimes we can't part is when we need another method, all right? 
So we've got this picture, all right? So it says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by this curve, y equals x minus one, x minus three squared, and y equals zero about the x-axis. And so we can say that this is the red curve in the picture, right? That function that they give us is the red curve in the picture. And then they actually tell us that it's also bounded by y equals zero, which we know to be the x-axis, right? So we're taking this green shaded region and exactly we're rotating it about the y-axis. And we can tell where that little circly arrow thing, or we can go ahead and highlight what we have here. So based off of what we wrote up here, all right, I've got a vertical axis of revolution. If I want to use disk or washer method, which way should I draw the purple lines? Yeah, I would want to draw my purple lines horizontally, right? Okay. So we set up here that if the axis of revolution is vertical, then we also know that our horizontal lines are perpendicular to the axis of revolution. That means those purple lines better be horizontal or going side to side. Well, what does that mean for our diagram? Right, those are lines. They are perpendicular to my axis of revolution. How does that picture feel for you? Not ideal. And, ah, okay. Okay, so when we look at this, right, I hope this makes us somewhere in that gut feel a little bit uncomfortable and not in a like, I'm gonna throw up because I don't like this volume section sort of uncomfortable, but uncomfortable because it looks different than a lot of the other situations we looked at. Right. And I think that in the chat, we've got a few ideas here that if I look at this, this purple line, the right curve is this x minus one, x minus three squared. However, the left curve is also x minus one, x minus three squared. So when we draw the purple lines, this is problematic. Since the right and left, wow, okay, left curves are the same curve. when we look at this picture, this is a problem, right? In the past, every time we draw those purple lines, we have one function on one side, we have a different function on the other side. But we don't have that right now, okay? And so, let's see, I always forget which way to do this. Never mind. All right. And so, <clears throat> yes, ideally, if I were to draw this picture, right? If I were to draw this picture, if I had lines like this, I have a top function and a bottom function. Then, in fact, the red curve is the top function and the green curve is the bottom function. 
that I know how to handle. Okay. And so if we draw a picture and we're like, ooh, this just feels like it goes against what we're supposed to be doing, maybe we need to draw a different picture. Okay. And so that is where our story begins with the cylindrical shells method. Okay. And so let's take a look at something. This method is often referred to as the shell method. Okay. And sort of like yesterday or two days ago, when we think about washer, a lot of us might think about like a laundry machine, but that's not actually where the initial name came from, right? And when someone says shell method, you know, we, most of us, I think, live in San Diego. And so we're like, oh, shells, like shells on the beach, right? That makes sense. Um, if you've never, uh, encountered Marcel the shell on the interweb, I would just, if you need a study break tonight, I would go check out Marcel the shell. He's got some cute videos, might make you feel a little bit less stressed about, uh, you know, tomorrow's exam. But all three of these in the top row, these visuals of shells are unfortunately not what we mean when we say shell method, okay? Rather, You all know I like dogs, but rather we want to think about this idea of these sort of nesting dolls. Okay. And so if we look at, um, if we look at this first picture over here, right, we've got a bunch of dogs. They're all different sizes, but they're all dogs, right? We have like a beagle situation, a bulldog. I think that's a golden retriever, a little pug a St. Bernard, right? We've got a lot of different dogs, but they're all relatively the same shape, okay? And in this case, we might even say that they're almost like cylinders, right? And if you've ever seen one of these, you know that like the little one fits inside the next little one, and then the second little one goes inside the third little one, and then like the third little one goes inside the fourth one, and then all of them go inside of the big one, right? And so this might be like a better picture for that. You can see that like all of the bottom parts of the bodies of the dogs are stacked in there. And when we look, we have sort of these cylinders that are nested inside of each other. Okay. And perhaps an even better visual is this one because we can see the cylinders inside of each other. All right. And so when we say shell method, we really mean cylinder method. Or sometimes we for, refer to this as cylindrical shells. Okay. Um, has anyone here ever heard of the phrase uh, that you're like a shell of a person or a, a shell of your former self? Okay, you may or may not have heard that term, but when someone is referred to as like, you're a shell of a person, it typically means that like, they feel really empty inside, that they're just sort of like the outside part is there, but maybe they're just really sad. There's not a lot left inside right now, you know, whatever it might be. Sometimes we say that that's like, that's a shell of a person, right? Especially if someone's been through sort of a lot, maybe this calculus class has left you feeling like a shell of a person. I don't know. That's not my hope, but it's possible, right? And so when we say cylindrical shells, what we're really saying is um, that we have like, a cylinder, but it's literally empty inside. Okay, it's literally empty inside. Like um, the cardboard tube inside of a paper towel roll. 
or the cardboard tube inside of a toilet paper roll. Okay, so it's important when we're visualizing this that we know it's literally just the skin of the cylinder. There's no inside part, okay, just the skin. And if we think about this as one cylindrical shell, then we might think that there would be other cylindrical shells inside, sort of like this nesting doll situation. Okay. And so if we were to try and draw this, I think I can usually get two or three in here before it looks really not good. All right, so this blue one might be another shell that is inside of the first shell. And then we might have a really skinny one on the inside. Okay. Now the three shells that I've drawn here, they're all different sizes, right? Like some are uh, skinnier than others. And as we move into the questions, some might be shorter than others. But what's one thing that all of the shells share? In this case, they're all the same height. That is true. Um, I could have, if I wanted to, drawn one of them a little bit shorter than the rest, and that actually would have been okay as well. Okay. So maybe these, the black one and the blue one are the same, but maybe there's like a tiny orange one in the middle. Okay. But yeah, so the one thing that these cylinders all share is an axis down the middle. And we might almost think about that axis as like most houses, if you have toilet paper, you have like the little roll that you put the toilet paper on, right? That middle roll that is like this axis. And in fact, we might even call it an axis of revolution, okay? So all of these shells, no matter their height, no matter their radius, they are all centered around the same axis of revolution, okay? And so we're gonna see that a lot of these, like these dogs down here, some of them might be taller, some of them might be shorter, some of them might be um, thinner, some of them might be more St. Bernardish, the really big dog on the outside, but they're all going to share this axis of revolution. Okay. And so let's take a look at some pictures that are a little bit more in line with uh, calculus. Okay. So I'm gonna copy this picture first before I start drawing on it. Okay. And so what I'd like us to do is think about um, the two methods, all right? So we're gonna take a look at washer and then we're gonna take a look at shell. All right, so if you look at this, left-hand picture, this one right here. And I say, I want you to use washer method to solve this problem. Let's start off with uh, the axis of revolution. What would your axis of revolution be? And in particular, this is like our uh, purple line, okay? Good. Yes, if we want to use washer, we are going to need an axis of revolution that is the x axis. Okay. And we know this because this purple line, if we were to draw more of them, would be stacked along the x axis. Okay. 
So we are creating disks, disks where the radius of each disk is equal to the distance between the curve, yes, and the x-axis, exactly. And so is this going to be a disk method or a washer method? Mm, good. So this is going to be disk because I have all of these purple lines are going to touch my axis of revolution, right? So in other words, we're saying area equals pi little r squared for our formula. Now, I want to clarify something. <clears throat> One thing I realized when I was reading through the discussion that was due yesterday is that people were talking about the second half of something. And that's a really common misconception, right? Because I think when I was drawing them, I was like, well, if you don't know what it looks like, you can sort of draw the other part down here, right? But I want to make one thing really clear, and that is we're taking this line and we're spinning it around the axis. The way our integral is set up, the integral takes care of taking the line, spinning it into a circle. That's why we get that circle formula, OK? There's no second half. We're not multiplying by two because there's a bottom part to the picture, right? We're drawing something in two dimension to represent something in three dimension. All right, so I would really encourage you to unpack that idea a little bit more because it's not like, oh, here's the top half and then I'm going to find the bottom half. It's not an area question. A volume question. Okay. And so, in particular, that video I had you watch, this, when I revolve it, creates the new shape. And with our integral, we're able to find the volume of that new shape. Okay. Now, with shell method, Okay, so let's take a look at the same picture, but we're going to say we're using a different method. Okay, so in shell method, all right, if we're looking at a axis of revolution, it turns out we're not trying to find a perpendicular relationship, but rather like the two L's at the end of shell, we're looking for a parallel situation, okay? So if you draw a picture like this on the left, you are telling me you're going to use washer method. If you draw a picture like this, you are telling me you're using shell method, all right? And that, my friends, is why I've been so insistent that we draw that purple line, because that purple line tells us which method someone is using, right? And even if you don't draw it, it's important to be able to look at a picture and say, if I see a picture like this, that individual wants to use shell method, okay? So it's a lot more than me being picky about a diagram it's me being picky about a diagram, and here's why it's helpful, okay? Ah, that's a good question. So no, these are not going to give us the same volume because we're revolving them around different axes, okay? Yeah, so they're gonna give us different 3D shapes. However, it is possible that we can solve the same problem using washer and shell. Our pictures would just look different. But I want to unpack this a little bit more. So let me go back to washer for a moment. This purple line is the radius of a circle. Okay. 
And if we look at shell, we know that our axis of revolution is the y axis here because it must be parallel to that purple line. But what does that purple line represent? All right. So I am going to attempt to draw this one because I think it's important for us to see. Oh, well, that's not a good start. All right. So let's kind of imagine what this looks like. Let's say we have the other side of this. If I want to take this and revolve it around the y-axis, then I'll end up with something like that. And that purple line would sort of also get reflected over. And it turns out that these purple lines that we drew do in fact represent the height of a shell or of a cylinder. So the purple lines are heights of a cylinder, okay? This is different from the washer method, sorry. This is different from a washer method because the washer method, that purple line was the radius of one slice. Now that purple line, when we set it up for a shell method actually represents the height of the cylinder. And so we might imagine that if we drew another purple line, maybe like somewhere in here, that now we can see that this inside shell, it still has the same axis of revolution, but this diagram I think is better than the first one I drew because now we can see that the height of the shells might be different, right? We might anticipate there's gonna be shorter ones down here, there's gonna be taller ones out here, but they all change with relation to this function. Okay. So, Let's take a look at what I think might be a helpful picture and maybe a chart to kind of fill in. All right. So this is the actual picture from the website that, uh, you know, used computer generated skills rather than my sort of hand drawn situation to model what it is to be a shell. Okay. And we can kind of tell we can see sort of the tops of all of these cylinders here, but that all of the heights are defined by that function, right? So if we were to put the purple lines in on these diagrams, we would have ones like this would be a height, maybe one in here would be like a little bit shorter. Okay, but all of those represents the height of the, of the shell and they're all sharing a radius in that is around the axis of revolution. Okay. Now, let's imagine for a moment that we took just this one shell. Okay, now remember this shell is super, super thin, like thinner than that cardboard paper tube inside of a roll of paper towels. Super, super thin, infinitely thin, okay? And speaking of infinitely thin, these, the radii of the circle are also infinitely thin. And so that was another piece that came up in some of the discussions I was reading that some people were like, but how many are there? The answer to that is there are an infinite amount because we're looking at things that are infinitely thin. Okay. 
But if I take this particular shell and I take a pair of scissors and I just cut along one part of it, and then I unroll it and lay it flat on a table. What shape do I get? Yeah, we get a rectangle, okay? So I'm gonna draw a rectangle off to the side, all right? So let's imagine that we unraveled this shell and we ended up with a rectangle, okay? Now we know that this rectangle is sort of, I know this is not to scale, but it represents the unraveled cylinder, okay? Now, if we think about a cylinder, a cylinder typically has a height, right? And so on my unraveled cylinder, I still have a height. And then if I have a shell that is so, so thin, this top part essentially is like the circumference of the circle. And the formula for circumference is 2 pi r. Right. So when I unravel it, the circumference of my shell becomes the sort of base, if you will, of my rectangle. Right. So this part right here, this is your circumference equals 2 pi r. And when I just cut with a pair of scissors and open up this shell, I end up with a rectangle that has 2 pi r as one side and height as the other side. So you folks tell me, what's the area of this rectangle? Good. Base times height, right? Base times height, but this time our base is 2 pi r and our height is height. So we can write area as 2 pi r h, right? So we're going to be using this as our area formula. We're not using pi r squared for shell method because we're not slicing into circles we are gonna use two pi r h because we're gonna divide, excuse me, the shape into a bazillion cylinders that are nested inside of each other. So we need to use an area formula that corresponds to the image that we're using. Now, I'm wondering if you can tell me in this diagram, if I asked you about the radius, would you tell me that's an X value or a Y value? Yeah, the radius would be somewhere this way, right? Okay. What about the height? Is the height an X value or a Y value? Yeah, the height goes this way for sure. That's a Y value. Okay. Now let's kind of think about um, a few cases, all right? I want us to keep this chart in mind. We're gonna come back to this chart uh, in a little bit. 
But I find again that, you know, copying formulas down on a page or whatever, I mean, sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes what is more helpful is if we reorganize our thoughts. Right. So in particular, something like this might help you make decisions a little bit better on the exam tomorrow. Right. So we'll come back and fill this in. But what I would really love to do is to actually set up and solve that very first question that we were like, we can't use washer method and we can't use washer method because that right curve and the left curve were the same curve. Okay, so before we take our break, I would love to set up that question just so that we have something to kind of see about what the process is like, right? Listening to the story is one thing, but applying the story to an actual question is another thing. All right, so here we go. We have the volume of this solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by this function, y equals x minus one, x minus three squared, and y equals zero, which we know is sort of this line down here. And we are revolving this about the y-axis. And if we revolve this, right? Good thing I found these fancy diagrams to help draw things that I could not draw very well by hand, all right? What we have here is, um, I don't know if anybody's ever had this. There's a whole company that sells these cakes. Anybody ever heard of a bunt cake? <laughs> yes. Okay. So this shape, if I take this fabulous cubic function and I revolve it around the y axis, I get sort of a bunt cake situation, right? And if you've never had one, there are there is one company, I think it's a little bit more commercialized. I'm sure there are other companies that are a little bit more homey. There's called Nothing Bunt Cake. And they sell little ones too. So you could buy like a personal one as a celebration, you know, after you finished your exam tomorrow or something like that. But <laughs> yes, some people don't like the sweets so much. I, I like sweets, but uh, it, it's not for everyone, so. But we have this bunt cake, all right? And if you've seen a bunt cake, you know that like the inside has sort of been scooped out, right? <laughs> I wish I were sponsored by them. I'm no, in no way, if I was like an influencer or calculus teacher, that'd be pretty cool, I guess. Maybe we could get them to send us all free donuts or something, right? <laughs> okay, so there's sort of a scooped out part that's missing here. OK, but one way, if we wanted to use disk method, we could serve the cake this way. Right, we could sort of cut across the cake. Right. And someone would get like the top slice and someone would get a bottom, like a middle. Someone would get the bottom slice. And all of those slices would be using like washer method. Right. But it's sort of a very unnatural way to cut um, cut a cake, right? Well, it turns out that shell method is also a very unnatural way to cut a cake. Because the way I would cut this is I would have someone would get like a shape like this. And then someone else would get maybe one that was like a little bit shorter and wider. And so I would literally have to like stand with my knife over the top of the cake and sort of cut a cylinder out. Very strange. But it turns out that that's actually an effective way to find the volume, okay? And so if we, insert our axis of revolution here just to keep ourselves centered okay let's think about 
those purple lines, right? How do we include those in our diagram? And in this original one, I could say that maybe one of the shells, someone would get a slice of cake that is maybe 0.5 inches tall. Someone else might get one that is almost like 1.25 inches tall. Someone else, ooh, I think there's two someones who might not be super happy with their cake slice. Someone else might get a slice of cake that is like 0.1 inches tall, right? Someone else might get one that's sort of in the middle over here. But all of these lines represent the height of the cylindrical shell. Okay. It does not represent the radius, it represents the height of a cylinder. And so I'm going to sort of zoom in a little bit here so I can draw like right on this diagram what the cylinder would look like. Okay, So one of the cylinders might look something like this. Right, That would be someone's slice of cake. Remember, it's hollow on the inside. Someone else might have a slice That looks like this. Theirs is a little bit taller and the radius is a little bit bigger, but they share the same axis of revolution. And then there's this poor someone, maybe this can be Abby because it won't be too sweet, has like the shortest little cylinder of cake, right? So everybody can have a different size of slice. <laughs> yes, but it's, it's hollow though, right? It's hollow. There's nothing on the inside. It is literally a shell of a slice. So take that for what you will, right? But when we're looking at this height of a cylindrical shell, knowing that we're gonna put this into this area formula, two pi r h, it would be important to figure out what my radius is, okay? So in this case, we could say the height of the shell corresponds to Y values, right? That's what you all told me in the last diagram. And it still holds true here because these are vertical lines and so they represent Y values. But the radius of each cylindrical shell Those we could say are x values. All right. And in fact, let's say Abby got that tiny, tiny, the last slice, the one on the furthest on the outside. What is the radius of her slice? Ooh, tell me why you say two. Ah, tell me why you did three minus one. Mm, okay, okay. So maybe, maybe a better question that I should ask is if this is my axis of revolution and this is the widest radius that we can have, how big is that radius? And rather, how big is the distance from the axis of revolution?
Okay. Uh, let's say someone else in the class also wants a very, very small slice and they get the slice that's right here. What's the radius of their slice? Yeah, I would agree that the person who gets the innermost slice, this has a radius of one, right? So now let's go back to Abby's slice. Here's my axis of revolution. Here's Abby's slice. What's the radius of her slice? Three. Okay. So let's take a look at these x values. At x equals one, I said the radius was one. You all said the radius was one. At x equals three, the radius is three. What do you think the radius of this slice is gonna be? Two, okay. So it turns out that for our cases, because we're looking at that axis of revolution being the X axis or the Y axis, if you know the radius is X values, you can actually just say that it's gonna be X. That's what you're gonna put into your equation. Okay, so the radius, if you know the radius is going along the X axis, for our situations, you can assume that that means the radius, we can put X into our equation. So let's try and set this up. Let's see. Let's see. Volume equals the integral of area dx or dy. All right. Now we're going to ask ourselves the same question, even though the, the purple lines uh, represent something different than they did in the disk method or the washer method. The question we're going to ask ourselves is this purple line, all these purple lines that we drew, are they stacking along the x axis or along the y axis? Yeah, all of these purple lines are stacking along the x axis. This means that my integral will be dx. Another clue for that, though is where your radius is. If your radius is X values, you're gonna choose DX. But if your radius is Y values, you're gonna choose DY, okay? So the radius, it's not in this picture, right? It's not the purple lines, but it does tell us whether we should be DX or DY. And so, what does this equation look like? Well, we're going to need the integral of some bounds. We'll figure that out later. But the area formula, if you draw the picture that you just drew up there, and then you go in there and you write this, I would be so sad. because everything about your diagram says shell method. And then shell method means cylinders, which means two pi RH, but then you went ahead and tried to do washer method. Okay, so the area formula that you use does depend on your method. You wanna use shell method, your area formula better be two pi RH, okay? Let's get rid of this. Now, Matt, I think you were kind of hinting at what these bounds are. What do you think the bounds are? And anyone can answer this, but what do we think the bounds are for this particular question? Where are we starting to count our radius? Where are we finishing our radius count? Yeah, that smallest radius is at one. The biggest radius is at three. No, not at all. One and three. Now we already know what we can put in for the radius. We know that the radius is X values. So we can put an X in for radius, okay? 
But if we're looking at the height, how would I use the functions I have to define the height of the shell? Very nice. We're going back to that top minus bottom idea from 6.1, okay? So in this case, we would take our red function, x minus one, x minus three squared, and we would subtract zero because that's our bottom function. Exactly, I really love the way you phrase that. The height is your y value at each input and so we'll take the top function minus the bottom function. Okay. And so let's substitute in all of these pieces. Now, before I had like a pi r squared when I was doing disk or washer method, and we brought the pi out to the front. This time I have a two pi, so I'm gonna bring the two pi out to the front. One and three, my radius is going to be x. And my height is going to be x minus 1, x minus 3 squared minus 0. And I'm putting in the minus 0 because even though in this particular question, we have a bottom function where it doesn't matter if we subtract or not, right? Subtracting zero, it, it doesn't matter if we do or not, it's gonna be the same thing. But I wanna put that in there because you might encounter a situation where you do have to subtract something, okay? Now, I wanna ask us, a really important question here. We talked a little bit about the idea of symmetry, right? And when we did disk and washer method, sometimes I said, let's use symmetry and then we'll just double it and cut one of the bounds in half. And that was why we had two in the front a lot. But I wanna clarify here that this two does not come from symmetry. This two, comes from the area of each shell, okay? So every time you see a two, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have symmetry. It just means that you might be using a different method, okay? So I see a question in the chat. How do we know that X is the radius? Well, if we're thinking about the, where the radius of each of these shells are, right? There's like this slice right here in this in the middle. That one has a radius of one. Maybe I have one like here. That one has a radius of two. And I could sort of keep going, but the pattern that we find is that that radius corresponds to the x values because the radius is sort of moving along the x axis. Okay, so in other words, this is like a uh, paper towel tube that's standing up and down, and you're looking to see like where the different sheets of paper towels are. Okay. So this is again sort of like a lot of setup right and we're going to come back and we'll do more examples. Um, but in this case, if you did want to finish solving this you would need to do a lot of foiling here and you wanna make sure you do it accurately. And you should end up with something like this. And I believe we should end up with 24 pi over five. So again, the computation piece, not that it's less important, but it should be something that flows fairly quickly for us, right? Um, but 
the setup, the idea, the concept, like how do we set up that equation? Because if you have the wrong equation and you're still able to solve it, I don't know that that really shows that you understand it, unfortunately, right? So we really want to make sure that this setup, all of that is reflected in your diagram, okay? And so I think this is a good place to pause right now. And we're going to stop when we take a break. And when we come back, we'll take a look at a few other variations of this shell method. OK, and I've tried to include some other pictures so we can see like where we're uh, going with this. But I think it'll be really important for us to think about the height and the radius of these shells and how we know whether they're X or Y. OK, so I'm going to pause the video right now. All right, so we did one example before the break, and what we're going to do right now is take one where we could, in fact, solve it in both the disk method or the shell method. Okay, and so we'll kind of talk about that because I think comparing the two different methods actually makes what the methods individually make a little bit more sense. Okay, and so we have this lovely diagram here. All right. We've got uh, a, a volume of a solid. We're rotating this region that is bounded by this cube root and x equals 8 and the y axis. And we're taking this and we're revolving it around the x axis. All right. So if we go ahead and sort of draw that in. One of the diagrams that we might recall is that if we're revolving it around the x-axis, what we'll end up here with is sort of a nice uh, bowl-looking situation, all right? A bowl-looking situation that is facing to the right, all right? And I could take this and I could slice a bunch of circles this way. And if I sliced circles this way, what method are we using? Uh, no, we would not be using shell method. All right, if we take this and we cut, each of the cuts that we make are going to be making circles. Right. And if we cut that way, we'll be using disk or washer method. OK, so that is certainly one possibility. And so let's take this diagram and let's set it up. As if we were going to use washer method. OK, so if I was going to use washer me method for this, right? So think back to yesterday. If I was going to use washer method, my axis of revolution is horizontal. So my purple lines need to be vertical, right? By definition, if I want to use washer method, these purple lines have to be perpendicular to my axis of revolution, right? Now, if I wanted to use washer method here, I would need volume equals pi r squared dx. And so I just want to leave that up on the screen for a moment and make sure we understand why we're using pi r squared dx. Right. So in the past, I've sort of asked you step by step, how do we know what we're using here? So take a moment and ask those questions to yourself. Do you understand why we're using pi r squared dx? All right, great question. Let's see, why are we not using big r squared minus little r squared? Anybody have an answer for that? Because it's solid, exactly, right? Every single, oops, every single one of these purple lines they touch my axis of revolution, right? And so I think sometimes when we are listening to lecture, right, because of all the little questions, it makes sense why we're doing the things that we're doing. But between today and tomorrow, and I know that's a bit, that's a real quick turnaround, you need to ask yourself these questions, 
Okay, you need to ask yourself, how do I know why it's not this? How do I know why it's not that? All right, so we have this equation right here, and we can go ahead and start to fill in some of this information. And so in particular, I'm gonna go ahead and bring the pi out to the front. My bounds are gonna be zero to eight, and I'm gonna have the cube root of x squared dx. So again, I'm giving you the answer. I'm not giving you, I'm not telling you where I got these numbers from. Take a moment, look at this. Does this make sense to you? Make sure you know why we're going from zero to eight, why we have that cube root of X and why are we squaring it, All right? If you can answer those questions, you're off to a good start, okay? But if you cannot answer those questions yet, then there needs to be a lot of work before tomorrow's exam, okay? Now, I want to go back to sort of this original question, though, because this question asks us to use shell method. As soon as they ask us to use shell method and we have our axis of revolution, which direction should we draw our purple lines? Good, our purple lines should be parallel to my axis of revolution, right? And all of these lines represent the height of a cylinder, okay? In fact, we can see in the diagrams below, this is one of the purple lines. And it is indeed the height of a cylinder, right? The height of a cylinder is always the distance between the top and bottom parts of the cylinder. Now, as soon as I see shell method, I'm also thinking my area is gonna be two pi r h. All right, someone tell me why I'm using area equals two pi r h instead of pi r squared. Right. So two pi r h is not the circumference of the cylinder. Two pi r is the circumference, right? But two pi r h gives us the area of the shell, okay? There we go. That is the area of the shell, okay? So we have this area of the shell. If I want to use shell method, I have to use the area formula for the shell, okay? Now, I just wanna pause for a moment. I see some questions in the chat. It's not that I'm not answering these, but I feel like we're all a little bit stressed right now and it's coming through in the chat because we're like nervous about the test being tomorrow, okay? The more worked up you get yourself in your head, the less you're gonna hear from lecture, the harder tomorrow will be, okay? So just take a moment right now it's okay to be stressed out. I know that, you know, the last exam is sort of like a very heavy thing, especially if you're borderline between some grades. But just take a few breaths, all right? This exam is not going to be suddenly very different than the other exams. If you've been in this course all semester, all summer, you know how I ask questions. The way I ask questions in lecture try and help guide the thinking that I want you to do on the exam. Okay, that's not changing. That's not changing for tomorrow, okay? So I'm talking about the differences between shell and washer method 
because I want us to understand the different setups, all right? So take a couple breaths. It's all gonna be fine, all right? You will, you will be able to learn stuff today, I promise. And yes, all of these things are very similar. Disc method, washer method, they are similar. We're finding volume of a shape, but what's different is we're splitting them into, are you cutting things into a bunch of circles or are you making a bunch of nested cylinders? That's the difference, okay? All right. So if we're going to use shell method, like we're asked to use shell method, if that's the case, we wanna use this area formula. And so it would be really helpful if we knew which direction the radius was going in, because the direction of the radius will tell us whether we should use dx or dy, okay? And so, Maybe before we move on to the actual equation, let's write down whether our radius and height are x values or y values, all right? Now I'm asking you to write this down now, not because I want it to just make sense now, but I think it could be a good problem solving technique on tomorrow's exam, right? If you don't know where to go, my suggestion is to write down your radius and write down your height and tell yourself, there are these x values or y values, okay? And as complicated as all of these diagrams look, I know you know that x values go this way. And I know that you know y values go this way, okay? So none of that is different. None of that is different from middle school or whenever the first time you learned about x, y coordinates, okay? So trust yourself a little bit more here. If we think about these purple lines and how they're parallel to the axis of revolution, we're thinking that these purple lines represent the height of the cylinder. And so would you describe these heights as X values or Y values? Okay, so we have 50-50 here, Y values or X values. 33-66. All right, so if I just drew like this horizontal piece, okay, not the direction that I'm stacking, that's not what I'm asking. This in it of itself, like if I cover this distance, that would be eight units in the X direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you were anticipating a different question, which is fine. But this distance in and of itself is gonna be an X value, right? This distance in and of itself is going to be an X value. If I were to draw another one here, that would be the X value. So the height of the cylinder in this case are going to be X values. And if we look at this diagram, I think that's a little bit easier to see. We can see that the radius kind of goes this way, right? The radius goes up from the X axis. So then we might say that the radius is actually Y values. Okay. And in particular, if I have this shell right here, all right, what's the radius of that shell? Hmm, one half. And check it out, that's the Y value there. Okay. What if I had a shell here? What's the radius of that shell? One, good. And that's the Y value, okay. Let's say that I had a shell here. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. All right, what's the radius of that shell? 1.5 and check it out. That is the Y value there, okay? So this radius is all the Y values. And I said earlier that we're gonna be focusing on that very specific case where if as long as you know it's a Y value, you can replace R in your equation for volume with the letter Y. Okay. Now, if we're going to be using Y as the radius, it also means that our integral will be dy. Okay, so that radius right there, super important for you to identify. So if you are lost, you don't know where to start, start with the radius. It tells you what letter you need in your volume equation, and it tells you dx or dy. Okay. Now what that means then is my height, if they're x values, I should have equations with y in it. And so all of this work that we've done up here is previewing and pre-thinking what we need to write in our equation below, all right? So let's finish up this pre-thinking. Over here, I have y equals the cube root of x. How do I rewrite that? Yeah, I'm gonna get x equals y cubed. Now y cubed, is going to be part of what I use to find the height of the cylinder. Okay. All right. So volume equals the integral of area. We know that we're using dy here, right? Because the radius told us so. We also want to choose the area formula for the cylinder, the cylindrical shell. So the integral of two pi times the radius times the height dy, all right? And now while we're here, I'm wondering if you can tell me what the bounds are gonna be for this, right? What are the bounds? Okay, now remember, because the radius told us y, that means we need dy. That also means we need to choose y values for our bound, right? Everything's got to match. If you keep that at the center of what you're doing, that everything has to match, that actually avoids a lot of the issue, okay? So we are going to be counting the radius starting at zero and ending at two. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in for my bounds, zero and two, All right? And if I start to simplify a little bit, I'm going to bring the two pi out to the front. I'm going to have the integral from zero to two. And instead of the radius, I'm going to write y. the last thing we need to do is to fill in the height, all right? So let's rewind a little bit to 6.1, which was the end of last week, okay? And if I asked you to find the area of this shape, we would have to do exactly like Sophia says, which is we have to do right function minus left function, right? From the right function minus the left function will give us that distance. Right function minus left function will give us this distance. Hmm. You might've wondered why they give us x equals eight. Turns out the right function is x equals eight. So we're not going to say that the height is y cubed, but we're going to say that the height is 8, which is the right one, minus y cubed, which
which is the left one. Okay, so right minus left still comes into play. We're going to have 8 minus y cubed. And we'll annotate a little bit here. 8 is the right function, and y cubed is the left. Okay. All right, we've done pretty much all of the hard work. We found our area formula. We've made sure that all the numbers match, like they're all in the y world. And we've been really careful to think about what represents the height and what represents the radius. And from here, I feel confident that you can solve. And we should end up with a 96 pi over five. All right, so this particular question, I know we set this up using washer method, right? Example number three is a chance for you to try that again, sort of on your own. So you'll notice in example two, I said use shell method, but in example three, I'm telling you to use a different method. And so being able to set up the same question in two different ways, I think would be a very valuable skill to have. Okay. This one, to Luca's question earlier, because I'm revolving the shape around the same axis, this one should have the same answer as example two. Okay, now the reason why it has the same answer is because we're doing the same problem, right? We are taking that area, we're revolving around the x-axis, so same shape, same axis of revolution, we're just approaching it in two different ways. And so with that, let's pause for a moment, all right? Like I said, I felt like we were sort of getting a little bit anxious and nervous and maybe spending more of our energy than would be beneficial in things that uh, maybe like worried about how much we can or can't control something. So let me pause here for a moment. Let's kind of take a look at example two and let's see if there are any questions that are coming up right now. Okay, so let me make sure I understand the question correctly. For shell method, what you mean by it is the purple line, is that? Yes, okay, nope, no worries. I just wanna make sure I'm answering the right question, right? So yes, for shell, for shell method, purple line, oh, purple lines will always be parallel to the axis of revolution and the purple lines represent height of the symmetrical okay. I think that's like a really good sentence to write down somewhere. I think that sometimes I've looked at the reference sheets and I've seen a lot of equations being dumped on pages and that's all fine and good. But sometimes these narrated parts actually help us more than just the formula to decide all the things we need to decide. Okay. 
I'm wondering as sort of an exercise in preparing for tomorrow, can we take that sentence and modify it for washer method? Okay, so take a moment, think about what you would change about this sentence and what you would keep for washer method, and then send me a message that is the modified version of this for washer method. Good, good, good. So I'll give folks a little bit more time if they're still typing. All right, but so far I'm seeing a lot of really great answers. Take another 30 seconds in case you're still typing. I'm go ahead and send that right over. All right, so thank you for modifying those sentences, all right? I think that things that are in the chat are always useful as well when you're thinking about pulling that whole picture together, okay? All right, so in the remaining time, what I'd like to do is take a look at one more situation where we are going to solve a problem in two different ways. All right, so we're going to approach this using the shell method, and we are going to approach this using the washer method or disk and washer method. Okay. So, in example four, we say determine the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by x equals y minus two squared x equals zero and y equals zero about the x-axis using the shell method. And so you can label or draw your diagram in any way you choose. I like to really get that axis of revolution in there for myself so I can start to think about where my purple lines are because those purple lines tell me so much about the problem, right? And so in this case, since they are asking me to use shell method, right? Think about those two L's at the end, shell, right? It has two L's and those L's are also the same symbol as parallel, right? And so that might be a reminder inside your brain that when you see the word shell method, you wanna draw a purple line that is parallel to your axis of revolution, right? So for example, I might draw one right here that would be the height of a shell. This would be a height to a different shell. Okay. This would be the height to a very short shell, but a very wide shell. Okay. And so what we have here is almost like a sideways funnel or maybe like a sideways witch's hat, right? Something like that. And this purple line that we've drawn 
is the height of the shells that are sort of nested in there. Now, this is one of the shells. I'm going to attempt to draw another shell in here just so we can imagine what another one might look like. So, for example, we might have one kind of like this. Okay. So it shares that same axis of revolution, that axis down the middle. This shell, the second one that I drew, is like skinnier and taller than the one in the yellow on the diagram. But there's in between these two, there's like an infinite number of shells. We could have one that's like a little bit shorter and a little bit wider. We could have one that's even a little bit shorter and a little bit wider. All right, but they all share that axis of revolution. Now, let's think about our area formula. We see shell, we wanna write two pi r h. We do not want to write pi r squared. Okay. It would be useful to find our radius and our height. And by find, I mean, I want you to tell me whether they are X values or Y values, All right? So take a moment to do that. You can type that in the chat for me. What is your radius? What is your height? As in, is your radius an X value or a Y value? And is your height an X value or a Y value? Good, good, good. All right. So these, oops, this is indeed the height and it is a Y value or an X value. This is a height, it is an X value. This is a height, it is an X value. You might even want to write in for yourself you're going to need a right minus left. Okay. The radius then is the y value. What does that tell us? We want to use y in our equation for radius. We want to use dy to seal off our integral. Okay. So let's go ahead and set up that equation below. We've got volume equals the integral of area dy. Volume equals integral of two pi times the radius times the height dy. And in this case, our bounds, again, if you write down zero to four, nothing matches. Right? If you put zero to four, you chose X values for your bounds. We want to choose Y values. And in particular, we have a zero all the way up to a two. Now the radius, we're going to fill in with a Y. All right, we determined that already, predestined. The height, the only note we left for ourselves is we're gonna need right minus left. And so if we go back to the diagram for a moment, I'm wondering if you can tell me what is your right function? What is your left function? Yeah, right is the one you're given. X equals Y minus two squared. Good, good, good. Right, so this, uh, let's choose a different color. This is indeed your right function. And your left function is indeed that Y axis. 
right? All the purple lines go between the blue curve and the y-axis. We put that into our equation, we get two pi, the integral from zero to two of y times, uh, what do we have for that equation again? y minus two squared minus zero. Okay. Now I know we don't need to write the minus zero part, but that minus zero reminds me that I did have to do right curve minus left curve. I'll leave the computations to you, but we should end up with eight pi over three. So let's get that all on one page for you. Okay, so that is the shell method set up for this problem. So let's pause here for a moment are there any questions that are coming up right now? So before we go on to example five, which is going to be the exact same question, but we're going to do it in terms of disk and washer method. All right, so before we move there, let's see if we can think about what's going to change in our diagram, in our equation setup, OK? So just like I asked you to change the question or the sentences earlier, like for shell method, we do this, but then for washer method, we do the other thing, right? And you were able to change that sentence for me. Let's think about changing it in an actual problem, right? And in particular, let's start with the diagram. If the diagram is meant to show disk or washer method, what do I need to change about that diagram? Good, good. If I say disc or washer, so I don't say shell, I say disc or washer, you better be drawing lines that are perpendicular to your axis of revolution, right? And what would you tell me that those lines represent? Good, those purple lines, if I draw them this way, would be the radius of each circle. Exactly, exactly, okay? That's how your diagram would change. How would your area equation change? Good, good, good. I wouldn't use two pi r h. I would use pi r squared or pi big r squared minus little r squared, depending on the situation, okay? So the diagram is gonna change. The area formula is gonna change. And let's see what happens about this. So let's go ahead and take a look at example five. All right, same exact picture, but I am asking you now to use disk or washer method. All right. So similarly, I'm gonna go, oh, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna draw my axis of revolution, right? As soon as I have my axis of revolution, I can draw in the lines that are perpendicular, right? I draw in these perpendicular lines. I note that these are the radius 
of a circle. So many choices. But as long as we sort of think about them in a methodical way, I think they don't get too overwhelming. Okay. Based on the diagram, would you say we should use disk or washer method? Good, good, good. I would agree. We're going to use disk method. So we want area equals pi r squared. All right. And if you're not sure why we're using disk method, that is a good question to ask one of your peers or me later on. Okay. So if you don't know why that is, that's a good question to know the answer to. All right. dx or dy? Good, I would agree. We're going to do dx because we are stacking circles along the x-axis, right? And again, if you're not sure why dx or dy, make sure you know why. Okay, make sure you know why. All right. Well, let's set up an integral here, right? So volume equals integral of area dx. I'm going to have the integral of pi times the radius squared dx. And if I put 0 to 2, that is a clear indication that I don't really know what I'm doing, right? If I put zero to two, those are Y values. They 100% don't match the DX. I would need to choose X values. So zero to four. Also, if I did this, that's also incorrect, right? Because now my bounds are X, my DX is at the end, and now I have this Y situation happening in the middle, right? So I'm mixing and matching, and unfortunately, that's not going to get me very far. So as a few folks have already pointed out, we need to take our function, we need to solve for Y, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and do that. We have x equals y minus 2 squared. I'm going to take the square root of both sides, but I know that I have plus or minus. Then I'm going to add 2 to both sides. y equals 2 plus or minus square root x. All right. Now here is where we need to be really careful. Right? We've talked a lot all semester about dropping a sign plus or minus has far more important uh, ramifications now than they did when you were in fifth grade. Okay, If you drop one of these signs right now, you're only going to get half of your curve. All right? So the way this one works the y, the two plus square root of x would give us like this part. The two minus would give us this part. So if you forget to do the plus minus and you only have a plus, you're actually gonna get this part of the curve, which does not match the diagram, okay? So, in this particular situation, we want to choose 2 minus the square root of x. So we get pi, the integral from 0 to 4, 
of 2 minus the square root of x squared dx. Okay. Got to be really careful about your computations here, but you should end up with the same answer you got from the previous question. Now, take a look at this integral for a moment. This one right here, right? This is the one you have to solve, right? Pi integral from zero to four, two minus the square root of x squared dx. And let's compare that to this one. Two pi integral from zero to two of y, y minus two squared. Some of you may say, I'm really good at foiling, I'm really good at distributing, and all of these are gonna be whole number powers. So maybe I like doing this method better. Okay. Some people are gonna say, I just really like disc or washer method better. So I'm gonna use this one. And even though I have some square roots, it is more worth it to me to answer it this way because I know how to answer it that way, all right? But sometimes we'll find that one method is going to be much easier than another method. And that's okay. All right. So I would say in this case, they're probably about equal in terms of computation. It really depends on what your strengths are. But the nice thing about having two different methods to solve a question is as long as your answers match, then you know your work is right. All right, so what I would like to do now is to go ahead and go back up to the chart that we didn't fill out at the very beginning, okay? So. This chart. So comparing disk and washer method, comparing dx or dy, and figuring out when we need to use which one. Okay. So we're going to start with disk method, and we're going to start in particular with disk method and dx. All right. And so if I ask you to use disk method and dx, what is your axis of revolution? Good, this is gonna be the X axis, okay? And my slices, no, my purple lines are perpendicular to the X axis, right? The purple lines are gonna be perpendicular to the X axis. And each one of these purple lines represents a slice in our volume. And our slices are either going to look like a circle or they're going to look like a washer. So either a disk or a washer. OK. Now, I'm wondering if you can tell me how each of these parts changes if I say you are finding shell method and at the end you already have a DX. Okay. So we want to talk about axis of revolution. We want to talk about the purple lines. And we want to think about what those slices look like. So our axis of revolution here is indeed the y-axis, okay? That means my purple lines are parallel to the y-axis. And my slices are gonna be 
hollow cylinders. All right, they are hollow cylinders. Now notice that my axis of revolution is the y-axis. And that's how I knew that my shell was going to go up and down like this. Okay. I want to add one thing here, though. Is my what is my radius going to be in this case? X value or Y value? Good. Radius is going to be the X value. And there's two clues that could have told you that. One is the DX. The DX and shell method means your radius is an X value. But the other one that you could have is that you're looking at your picture and you notice that the radius is going horizontally. Okay. So this is what it looks like when we have DX at the end. Let's see if we can repeat this process for what happens when we have the DY at the end. So let's start with the disk method or the disk and washer method. Tell me about the axis of revolution if it's dy. Tell me about the purple lines. Tell me what the slices look like. Now you're totally fine. I knew where you were going and that's a super valid question. Okay. So we've got a volume equation that is something, something dy. What is the axis of revolution if we're using disk or washer method? Good. Our axis of revolution here is the y axis. The purple lines are perpendicular to the y-axis. And our slices could either be a filled-in circle or a washer. OK. And so we might notice a few patterns here. We might notice that for disk and washer, dx tells us our axis of revolution, x-axis. dy tells us about our axis of revolution, OK? But this is only something we know to be true if we're using disk and washer method. The story changes when we do shell method, OK? So let's see if we can unpack this last box here. All right, what is our axis of revolution? What are our purple lines? What is our slice look like? And finally, what is our radius for this one when we're looking at shell method? All right, so this is shell method and it's dy. Good. I know right off the bat that my radius is going to be a y value. And I know that because I have a dy on the end. OK. I know that my slices, or the purple lines, rather, are parallel to my axis of revolution. And my axis of revolution is the x-axis. Right. Now, if my axis of revolution is the x-axis, I don't want to draw a picture that looks like this, but rather I want to take my picture and I want to rotate it 90 degrees. So in particular, once I have my axis of revolution, I can draw the shell And this 
will be the purple line, right? You can see that it's parallel to the x-axis. And we can also see that the radius is growing along the y-axis. And so I hope you find this chart to be helpful. I know we moved through that kind of quickly, but I would really encourage you to go through and reconstruct this for yourself. I think that would be a very good exercise in practicing for tomorrow's exam. I will tell you this, if you try and memorize everything for tomorrow, it's not gonna go well for you, okay? If that is your plan of attack is to memorize everything for tomorrow, it's not going to go well. Please take the time to try and understand where things are coming from. That will, even though it's a longer process, will give you so much more bang for your buck. Okay. I'm really looking for your understanding. I am not looking for memorization. Okay. All right. I see a question in the chat. Radius is given on the disk washer method because there are two functions. I'm not sure that I understand that question. You maybe rephrase that for me. Uh, I think he's saying that the radius is the distance between either the curve and the axis of revolution and the disk method or the curve and the, the top curve and the bottom curve and the washer method. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be true. Perfect. All right, so folks, we're going to finish off that lecture right here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.